And I believe we are now recording. Just out of curiosity, Jim, what is your gain at today? My gain is at zero. Ah, so again, all the way down. My gain is all the way down. <laughs> um, so welcome back to uh, Dragging Up the Past. I'm Brant, he's Jim. Uh, if you've seen at least one episode of this, God bless you. Thank you. Like, <laughs> I suppose we should do online. introductions because, like, you know, we have no idea how many people are actually watching this. And it's one of one of the videos at this point is up to about 130 views, but I'm pretty sure that, you know, a good 15 or 20 of them are both you and me. Uh, so? Yeah, well. That's, that's not immoral. The point at which we hit four figures, we're going to throw ourselves a party. Fair so. enough. I, I do have to confess, you, you unintentionally gave me a chuckle earlier today when you said, hey, I'll ping you when I get back, but I'm heading to the gym. And and it's not that, you know, I, I don't picture you as being a relatively fit sort of dude. It's that, you know, my default image, mental image of you is a cigar in one hand and a snifter of brandy in the other and your El Jefe cap on trying to figure out how to bomb around and blame somebody else for it. And, uh, <laughs> it, and I that just... Was six years ago. Yeah, well, but I, I just, I, I don't, in, given, given the meatheads that typically hang out at gyms that we, we have this stereotypical vision of, I just don't see you, you know, sort of on, on, on a treadmill somewhere working out, having a conversation with the dude next to you about, you know, Greek philosophical thought and its, and, and its influence on the Napoleonic Code. And, and I can see that conversation with you happening anywhere else in your life, except perhaps at the gym. And so that's that's why it's it's very it, it's an odd image to reconcile. Well, my well, I will tell you even worse. My preferred gym here in the great state of Wisconsin, the city of Milwaukee, is uh, the Brickyard, which uh, has been uh, complimentarily described as a place looking like a bulldog chewed up the mats. So <laughs> it goes back to my days. I, st I started going there when. Uh, when, back in the days when I had, as it turned out, unfulfilled dreams of playing defensive end for the Green Bay Packers. That's a lot of years ago. Yeah. Wait, the Packers were around back then? It's quiet, you. <laughs> I thought you were going to tell me you were you were working out for your burgeoning MMA career on the senior circuit there. <laughs> yeah, they're going to do an intersex bout between me and Ronda Rousey just for the joy of watching her kick my head off. <laughs> All right, so uh, Dragon Magazine 171. Uh, you you want to take a guess as to as to time here before you go start looking up uh, what what the number one song was and the number one movie was? Uh, one, uh, gosh, does this well? Does it take us into the nineties? It does, in fact, take us into the nineties. So I will say 1990, 1994, June. You are way uh, overshooting it. Really? Okay. Yeah, this is this is early '90s. This is like '91, so we will get there momentarily. Okay. Um, so I will say this: despite the cool little candy stripe on the top, letting us know that there are new AD and D trading cards and a poster inside, they are not, in fact, in our screen reference document here, where we're going to be able to see them. And I'm sorry, um, but uh, the header across the top: always be prepared for a little surprise. Hey. That's what this show is all about, isn't it? <laughs> well, that's, that's why we do this without any kind of basic preparation. Yeah. Uh, we kind of look at a cover and go, hey, that looks cool, and we run with it. I, I, I will caveat it with this. The, the episode with number 73, I knew what was in there. I intentionally pulled that one, knowing what was in there, because, again, the, the whole key there was that was the first one that I had ever bought off the newsstand. So I knew what we were getting into with that one. And then the one with the Napoleonic skirmish rules I grabbed for you, again, knowing that that was going to be something you would get a kick out of. So beyond that, we're just totally making this crap up. And I want to give a shout out to Jack Nasty Face on the Grogheads forums, who has fond memories. In fact, he says that that was his, that's the one he actually still has from that era because of how much he loved the skirmish rules. So that's pretty cool. Yes. And... Let, let us, let us, however, deduct a few points from his score for also enjoying the fact that it put firearms in melee. Uh, that's, no, no, that's, a, that's actually minus four points. <laughs> it is. I, that, that, when I read that, I, I, I could understand it, especially, and he, he, well, 
let's see, he gets two points for liking the Napoleonic skirmish, minus four points for adding firearms to melee. But then he gets three points back for playing the skirmish with airfix plastic soldiers. Yes. Okay. Which is the which is so he's at a minus one in the aggregate. Sorry about that. Yeah. Well, we'll find a way to give him some points back at some point. I, we should probably just give him a couple of points for even bothering to watch the show. Fair enough. So yeah. that probably takes him. Probably should give him at least two, which would take him to a net plus one. There you go. All right. Anybody else out there watching the show, you can pick up some utterly meaningless and useful useless points. It's kind of like the them. points from uh, Whose Line Is It Anyway, right? <laughs> That's exactly what it is. <laughs> it is after this we model it. All righty. So uh, what's happening in Dragon Magazine number 171? Uh, Walden Books is still a going concern and still attempting to sell complete box sets of, of games to people who would like to overbox the sets and uh, slip a few extra things in there. Um forcing the guys behind the counter to go re-shrink them in order to fool subsequent customers. Is that about right? Right. <laughs> um, this was... So we well, were... That's how I read it. Yeah, well... That's absolutely how I read it. <laughs> we were starting to hit uh, drow fever here, thanks to uh, our, our boy Dritz and uh, Salvatore's series. Um, so the... Uh, the the Icewind Dale trilogy has already has already, I, I believe, fully published at this point, and and we're working our way towards subsequent Dritz novels, uh, but this is this is the height of second edition product proliferation. So we've got the arms and equipment guide. You'll notice we do not have a Rollmaster ad on the interior first page. Um, we we instead have the AD and D equivalent of arms law with the arms and equipment guide. <laughs> Oh, oh, I don't know. I mean, Arms and Equipment Guide is a good book. And I, well, I'm not saying that either is bad, but we have already left behind the insane level of detail that was uh, uh, Arms Law. Yeah. The Arms and Equipment Guide, which I, is sitting right behind me, um, is, a, is a pretty manageable tome in comparison. Yes, yes. Um, we've, we've left aside some combat complexities that people attempted to graft onto AD&D in favor of lots of non-weapon proficiencies, because God forbid we call them skills, and uh, <laughs> and and so now we're we're starting to have some uh, some some other rules pro proliferation elsewhere in the second edition D and D system that go beyond uh, you know detailed in killing people. Now we're going to get detailed in in other facets of our game. Um, but yeah, so so <laughs> we're we're starting to see that is some. True. Yeah, we're starting to see some spread amongst the settings in the D&D world, and so Forgotten Realms, this is this is all things Forgotten Realms. Uh, Greyhawk is, it, it's been sidelined, it's not been completely kicked to the curb, because the uh, Greyhawk Wars box set comes out around this time frame. The City of Greyhawk box set, which is still one of my all-time favorite box sets, comes out around this time frame, but right now it's, it's sort of all things Forgotten Realms, and so that's why we've got our Maztica ad on here. For the uh, the Aztec influenced corner of the Forgotten Realms. Um, hey, look, it's your Grenadier game. Yes, there it is. This thing, I, I've been meaning to look up the sales. We talked about it briefly, and I don't need to dwell here, but it's interesting. This thing obviously had a good run because we've seen this in uh, several episodes. Uh, played it, liked it. It was uh, their attempt to take a shot at Warhammer, didn't work out. Yeah, we're. Uh uh, from the last episode where we saw a mention of this to this one, um, we've had we've had thirty something issues go by in the in between. Um, people don't freak out. You you haven't missed thirty episodes of the show because we're not doing these in order. Um, but but you know it. We've got an ad here several years later for essentially the same product, and so that's not too bad. Um, this could very well be the same photos. It may well. Uh, all right, so July of ninety one. So this is this is early '90s. So while you look up July of '91 on the uh, pop culture charts, there, I will uh, I will run. Well, I'm already ready for you. But go ahead. <laughs> well, so our contents uh, again. I'm sorry we don't have the insert for the AD and D trading cards. That's not going to stop us from talking about them. I do like this the the guest editorial by Michael Stackpole. And guess what? We are still arguing about role playing and reality. Role playing and reality. The yes. dividing line is 
it's thicker than some people think. D- mm. Well, <laughs> this, the, why do they got to push my shiny red button? The the members of the audience may be thicker than some people think. <laughs> um, <laughs> you, you don't say. Oh, please tell me, Mister Stackpole. Tell me true. <laughs> Looking forward to this. We'll look and see. Uh, we have the who's who among dragons. So Bruce, uh, our good buddy Bruce Hurd, talks about uh, dragons as rulers of the realm somewhere out there, which is kind of a yes. Yes, yes. that's a neat concept. Um, yep. As we are recording this, we have just kicked off Thanksgiving at Grogheads, and so we have hunting tanks is fun and easy. Um, I promise I didn't pick this issue because that was there, but... I uh, thought it would be kind of neat to, you know, since it's here, we'll tie it into Thanksgiving. Um, if you want to play an orc, you got to think like an orc. It's probably a lot easier today, given the current political climate. Oh, um. <laughs> topical reference. Ooh. You like that? Uh, the Voyage of the Princess Arc, Bruce makes a second appearance. Uh, they don't call it the Savage Coast for nothing. So the Savage Coast originally appeared in the X9 module. Uh, was later brought back as the Red Steel campaign setting for AD&D, completely neutering any mention of the Mastara game world, uh, which is a little unfortunate. Uh, But for now, we've got Bruce exploring the Savage Coast, and so we'll take a look at that for a little bit. Um, I I do like this, the role of computers. There's actually a couple of different people in there. Uh, We're talking about Lemmings. This is years before Magic the Gathering was released, and yet somehow we have Lemmings. Oh, no, oh! I'm sorry. Is, we're not talking that, about the consumers. No, we are talking. We are. We are. We are talking about one of the great Amiga games of all time. Yes. Um, uh, role playing reviews. We got some great first level dungeons. I think we've talked before about my love for low level fantasy characters. Um, so yep. we, we've got some cool first level dungeon stuff in here, and I'm pretty sure I know what one or two of those are likely to be, just based on when this issue was released. You ready for pop culture time? Pop culture time, July of 91. We begin, as always, what was the number one song in America number, in July of 1991? Number one song in America, July of 91. So that was the summer I was home from college, and, and this is going to sound ridiculous, I was working at a Boy Scout camp for the summer, mainly because it kept me out of the house. So, so this, is, this is before Seattle took over the charts. Lots of pop bands are still out there, but there's still a lot of uh, 80s L.A. cheese metal still floating around. Um, uh, let me see. Oh, you know what it is? I'm betting it's, uh, it's, it's, it's Brian Adams. Everything I do, I do for you. Oh, so close. First of all, that is the dominant song of 1991, running from July 27th through September the 7th. But no, uh, Paula Abdul's Rush Rush. Okay, so do I get partial Rush, credit for the song. fact that the song I named was in fact number one during July? It, it was. Well, you get two credits. Number one, it is, as I say, the dominant song of the year, holding the charts for seven weeks. But... The other thing is, yes, it was indeed a number one during the month of this Dragon Magazine. Partial credit, two points. Okay, well, I'll take what I can do. And now you must answer the question, what is the the number one movie of July 1991? (sighs) Young Guns 2. It's the number one movie of the year. It's not Young Guns 2. Which one? (laughs) I originally originally said Young Guns 2. Number one movie of the year for July of 91. It's Uh, both the number one movie in July of 91. It's released in July of 91. And it's the number one movie of the year. All the movies that I can think of going to see that summer are not ones that I would put at the number one movie of the year setting. Um, Because, like, Air America does not in any way remotely deserve to be the number one movie of the year. So what what was it? (laughs) I'm gonna miss Terminator him. Two, T Two, Judgment Day. All right, yeah, and and one that actually wasn't million dollars. Yeah, it, and that was back before the Terminator franchise just got silly. So, well, remember, there's only one other movie prior to that. Yes, that's what I'm saying. So, this is so, before the franchise got silly. So, as a consequence, you you had there. I remember this 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 is when I saw first weekend. 
This is when I went out to in a big way because I was incredibly excited to to see this movie, and uh, and yeah, it's it's gotten weird since. So so two points on the trivia section, Brant. Well, I'll take what I can get. Usually I I. I, I'm usually better on the music than the movies anyway, so have to have to take what I can get. Um, I, uh, I I am a little bummed that I, I didn't do a little better with, with the movies, though, because it's not like T2 was some minor release. It, it, let's put it this way. It's not like it was American Ninja 2 sneaking in somewhere in the, in the charts. <laughs> um, <clears throat> all right, we're going to skip over the letters column because we, we tend to bog down a little too early in the in the show here <laughs> fair enough well going back and listening to a few of these man story time sort of takes over every now and then doesn't it <laughs> all right guest editorial uh by michael stackpole uh game designer writer member of the phoenix skeptics and uh let's say this is probably before michael stackpole became michael stackpole um I, <laughs> and and after decrying story time i am going to give you a brief digression at one there was one year at origins I don't remember if it was 06 or 07, where, where I managed to piss off in very rapid succession uh, Michael Stackpole and Lou Zocchi and Larry Elmore, all in the matter of about 15 minutes. I, uh, <clears throat> we were loading out the exhibit hall, and the guys from L2 let me borrow the cart that was at their booth just to schlep some of my stuff back out to my truck out at the loading dock. Um, that, uh, that cart turned out to belong to Lou. Didn't know it was Lou's. The guys from L2 didn't bother to tell Lou they'd let me use it. So as I'm bringing it back in to park back at L2's cart, Lou is yelling at me, that's my cart, you took off with my... No, I... The person who had possession of it actually let me use it. <laughs> they just didn't bother to tell the original owner. Um, but outside, it turned out that I was I had double parked Michael Stackpole and then trying to get out of his way, almost hit Larry Elmore. Um, uh -huh. Aha. Yeah. I was going to say, making Lou mad is not really that tough. No, yeah, no. So I don't know. But to to stack it with, and look, to stack on top of it, Stackpole and Elmore. I mean, that's just that's that's going for the legends there, you know. <laughs> so it uh, it it was not in any way intentional. It was all completely honest mistakes along the way. But yeah, I I, I was shooting for the legends of the game there there that day. Um, <laughs> so. So what what is what is Michael giving us here that's that's going to completely freak you out? Well, and unfortunately, I'm not as I'm not as wound up about this as I thought I would be having now glanced through it. This is part of the era of Dungeons and Dragons is going to make us all crazy. Yes. And he is writing an article. Uh, if if anything, I'm going to be I'm going to be mad at him for attacking a straw man because he holds up a book and you can see it's picture here in pursuit of satan the police and the occult and another book by a doctor don't know from where a dr carl a roshki uh, the author of a book of dubious scholarship entitled painted black uh, and here's here's the sort of thing that we were dealing with in july of 1991 <clears throat> that quote one of the old tricks of brainwashing perfected by military interrogators and even inquisitors centuries back, is to confound fantasy with reality. He goes on <laughs> to say, what distinguishes Dungeons and Dragons from other games is this open-endedness. No board exists, and there are no real rules in force, only some vague limits and options for each character. The identity of the player and the character, even though they are formally separate, tend to yeah. I have no doubt that there were individuals who played role-playing games that had a tenuous grip on reality. But do I need to tell anyone listening to this that we were mostly a bunch of sweaty, smelly, burping, chip-eating, soda-drinking guys that were talking about girls that we hadn't talked to yet? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're... Who... Whoever... Who... I... Okay, you and I, we've both been role players. Let's total up our years. Uh, mine is... Duh, 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 duh. Math is hard this early. Yeah. I have been a role player for almost 40 years. I, How long have you been a role player? Role player, 36, 37-ish. Okay, so you and I, 75 collective years of role playing. 
Have you ever met a person, male or female, young or old, that you felt was letting, not that, not that they were a knob, not that you didn't want to play with them, not that they had B.O., not any of that, was having a hard time distinguishing between them, their character and themselves? Uh, no. Okay. 75 years, two people, folks. I'm not saying it didn't happen. That's crazy. You never say never. But I just wonder who Mr. Stackpole is writing against. Certainly, in my mind, nobody's serious. Well, and, and quite frankly... Here's here's how I would do this, and and you know I'm I'm clicking around and scrolling around a bit just so that people get a sense of sort of where the where the article is going here without actually scrolling through it in in its entirety for people to read the entire thing. But uh, honestly, what what I would take out of this is that Stackpole is attempting to provide the readers with some ammunition for an argument that he fully expects them to get into with someone who is not a gamer and not a reader of Dragon Magazine, and and attempting to give folks so, something they can fight back with. That's that's really how I would take this. That that would be my gut on on this. Um, I, obviously, you know, we don't have Stackpole on speed dial that we can just call him up and say, hey, what were you thinking with this? Uh, maybe someday I'll ask him about it. If we ever run into him at a game convention sometime, or, or better yet, you can go ask him about it, because I'll probably be balled up in the fetal position under a table with all the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the insanity that that we seem to inflict on ourselves. So um, we'll we'll have somebody ask him to fight. But that that would be my gut reaction on this: is that this is uh, providing ammunition for folks that consistently get into these arguments with people that have no idea what these games are about. That that's where I would see this going. Yeah, and um, again, I I just look at any such person and go, I'll happily tell you about it. I'll share my good experiences and my bad, but I have never once seen what you describe. Yeah. And so this is, I'm 99.9% .9 certain this is after the ridiculous Tom Hanks Mazes and Monsters movie, which was was a a fictionalized movie based on a book that had originally claimed to be nonfiction and turned out to be bullshit. Um, but I think this issue and therefore this editorial are being released before NBC aired, or maybe it was CBS, the, the utterly dreadful TV movie, Cruel Doubt. Um, so maybe, maybe you can IMDB that one on the side while we're, we're still chatting here. Um, it, Cruel Doubt, supposedly based on a true story, um, was, it, it was loosely based on an actual event here in Raleigh uh, with some college students supposedly took place on the NC State campus while I was attending. In, I mean, the, the, the movie came out while I was attending NC State. The incidents happened years before I was at school there. Um, but but had a, a very, very loose grasp on what role-playing was. And there were times where guys were holding one of the D&D books and supposedly reading out of them. And, and what they were reading was complete crap. I mean, it was it was scriptwriter stuff that was completely made up and was uh, never appeared anywhere in any D and D material ever. Nineteen ninety two. Okay, so we're still a year away. So the the hysteria drags on for at least another year here. Yay. Okay, let us head to our next page. Okay, so uh, we've got our who's who among dragons. We will get there momentarily. Uh, you can save at least 33% off of your cover price for Dragon and Dungeon combined down here. Um, of note, check out where the payments are going these days for TSR Inc. They're headed to Boston. <laughs> They're headed to Boston, Mass. I have a lot hill. Yeah. Or bring this form with payment to the TSR Periodicals booth at Gen Con. So you can bring a piece okay. of paper to Gen Con. I know, and it's and this is of course happening in Milwaukee. It's going to be there for several years yet, and these were these were special Gen Cons. But boy, oh boy, can you imagine trying to do a please print clearly thing with your credit card number on it? Oh, it's amazing there ever was a Gen Con. Yes. <laughs> um. All right, so Bruce. Uh, Bruce Hurd, who we've had on the broadcast and, and has some really cool stuff that he has been uh, doing independently now on Kickstarter with the world of Kaladar. Uh, Bruce started out just, I, I believe, was just a translator. Um, he, you know, he's, he's French. He, his native language is French. 
he uh, he started out translating stuff for TSR, and then slowly, well, not necessarily slowly, rapidly worked his way up in the hierarchy there to where he was essentially the godfather of the Mastara game world, of the known world from the BECMI series of, of box sets. And at this point, pretty much all of those rule sets are out. We're still a year or two away from the rule cyclopedia. Um, but we've taken the world of Mastara and started to expand it through the 80s in the different modules that added on to the original map from X1. But by now, most of the Gazetteers have been released. We've taken that game world from X1 and blown it up quite significantly. And now Bruce is kind of in charge of going back and coloring in the lines or, or coordinating the people that are coloring in uh, all those pencil sketches that everybody else drew on the map for them. And so we've got most of that happening in the Voyage of the Princess Ark series that we'll see a little later in this episode. Uh, but here's a, a one-off article on this. And so... That, that's the dragon from our companion uh, game box cover art. And what we had was a whole bunch of uh, dragons that actually have territories where they rule. And so that's what's highlighted here on the map. These are overlaid on that old X1 map that everybody knows and loves. So It's, it's, it's interesting. I never wrapped my head around the official universe of Dungeons and Dragons, which is a horrible thing to say. I used it as a toolbox to take me either into essentially medieval Europe, which is where I prefer to set my games at various stages in that, in that arc yeah. or in Tolkien's middle earth. Um, but it is interesting to see the thought that was put into something like this. And I do find this concept fascinating. The idea of a, a dragon, ruling an area a kingdom because clearly you know they don't have government in the traditional sense but yeah. even smaug is ruling the area relatively small though it be up near the lonely mountains so there's yeah. a pretty strong tradition of that and and anybody who's a mastara fan can can will identify this map as being one of the ones from the later rule books not the original x1 module because uh, first of all, Kelvin and Threshold and Loam are all specifically located on the map here. But in addition to that, you'll notice here's B4, B2, uh, B3 is hiding under here. These are the places where those modules take place. X1 is pu pushing you south off of the map because that's where the Isle of Dread is actually located. X4 and 5, the Desert Nomads combo set, are up here off the northwest corner of the map. Um, so you can see... Um, you know, this is this is one of the later ones once they started unifying all of those modules and placing them specifically in Mastara somewhere. Um, that is pretty cool. Yeah. We, uh, all right, again, guys, pull quote, graphic, something, wall of text. <laughs> I get there's a lot of info you want in there, but look, I, I'm like four years into my publication and layout career at this point. As a, a, a high school kid, and I'm, I'm a college, so this is the summer between my freshman and sophomore years of college, and and look, I knew to do these things. The professionals had to know to do these things, um, but here we go. So in Dragon issue number 170 that we'll probably get to in like a year and a half, uh, ancient secrets of the dragons in the D&D game world were revealed, but n nothing was said about the major draconic personalities in the known world. And so they have this network of kingdoms and dominions ruled by dragons, which is a really nifty concept. And so here you go. Here, here's, you know, Almarudia, right? The ruler is Marudi, a 14 hit die blue dragon. His lair is located at the southernmost end of a rocky desert strip. And, and so here we are. This is, here's the guy in charge. Tends to underestimate his foes to the point of being outright cocky. Aside from his jovial habits, is a rather peaceful creature. Never known a peaceful blue dragon, but it's not like I'm personal friends with a blue dragon anywhere. So. Your, your mileage may vary. Yes. Yes. Um, oh, Jim, here's one for you. This dragon is 323 years old. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> it's a she, though. It's a she. I was just she looking at age. Like, the 323 I, years I, I old caught my eye. And I would like to observe that I believe 323 is relatively young. 
Well, but here we have a, an 11 hit dice white dragon is a very old dragon now 112 years old. Okay, so what is the, no. <laughs> What's the ecology here? I, I don't know. Admit, I, I'm not, I'm not the expert here. I am, I am now very, now I'm going to, now I'm looking this up because I, I'm absolutely, because it well, must have to do, because look at um, the type of dragon. It, I, I'm right. It has to go, well, because a red dragon, Amberier, ruled by Amber, a 17 hit dice red dragon, yes. covers the Alton Tapas Mountains. He is a young, successful dragon, nearly 152 years old. Yep, there you so go. So yes, it must, it must go to race. Yes, it must. Yes. I don't... I, I, it's interesting, and this is something that... Man, perhaps this is a gap in my knowledge, because I never built the ecology of dragons the way it clearly exists. I used them as... Other than a couple of the more famous worms from legend, whether they be medieval legend or whether they be, of course, Tolkien, um, obviously there's a fairly firmly evolved ecology out here, and the magazine is, is, is named that for a reason. Yes. Yes. And here we have Thundar the Dragon, not Thundar the Barbarian. Sooner or later, you run out of names. Yes. Yes. I would not... That's... Okay. Uh, you know, I just said something nice, right? You heard <laughs> me say something nice. Oh, boy. I have... <laughs> I, I, have I have written... I have written rules uh, for... Uh, it's what I... It's a term I invented. Bu bureaucromancy. Um, <laughs> which is what I try to practice on a daily basis. <laughs> And, and one of my rules of bureaucromancy, it's a very high one, actually. Always be the person in the room with the courage to raise your hand and say, does anyone else think this is really stupid? <laughs> and I can come up with any number of examples where that person just didn't come out, and as a result, something dumb happened. <laughs> Who was not in the room to say, we are not naming a dragon Thundar? <laughs> nor, for that, nor for that matter, are we going to name a realm Conistan with the ruler Conistar. You know, this was this was nice. You guys were doing well, and you slipped into the stupid. Well, what do Con I find out about Conistan and Conistar are located in the Ethengar Khanate. So, for really? what that's worth, you're going to are you going to defend this? No. Okay, you're going to lose points just there. There's a difference between explaining and defending. Okay. <laughs> I can do one without the other. See, so Thundar, or is it Thunder? I, I got nothing. Thundar suggests two A's. I'm going to say Thunder. He's minus one third. What's the? That's actually a she. What's the modern? Thundar is a she. Oh, Thundar is a she. Hurler, yes. Thundar is a she. My apologies, man. Uh, treat Thundar as a large, huge drink as far as aging and ceremonies go. Okay. Colorful personality. Good. Uh, 13 HD, 73 hits. Eight, uh, okay. Uh, okay. Yes. Great. Great. Thundar. Rule of Thundiara. Yeah. Otherwise known as we ran out of ideas. Yeah. I just hate to be mean to Bruce like that. I, I, I'll tell him to his face. Give me his <laughs> number. I do not say these things. We're only putting it up on a podcast. I know. I'm not exactly talking. Well, he, he also only lives about a half an hour from you. That, that's true. He does. He actually does. I know that. Um, so. and everything I've never, I've, we've never met, but I, I am everything I've heard and everything I've read finds seems to be he's an altogether fine fellow. So I probably should be more circumspect. <laughs> can, can we please go to the next page because I'm going to have another attack. I do need to mention the orcs nest. Oh, sorry. Yes. The ads for the orcs nest have been everywhere in Dragon Magazine for a good five years now, and uh, and I know that because in the summer of '88. On our travels back from Europe, moving back stateside, uh, we spent a week and change in London, and I have been to the Orcs Nest. I, I spent money at the Orcs Nest. I bought a bunch of Battletech stuff, actually. Um, but but I have been to the Orcs Nest and spent money there. And I grabbed one of so the the Orcs head, this little circular thing right here. They used to have on uh, on little pins at the counter that you could grab and like stick to your to your jacket or whatever. I had one on my backpack. At, uh, in high school in Lawton, Oklahoma, and somebody asked me in in Lawton, Oklahoma, hey, 
isn't that the thing from the Orcs Nest? Why, yes, yes it is. And the only way you could get those pins was to actually go to the store. And uh, but the guy recognized it from the Dragon Magazine ads. So nice. Yes, this this international hobby of ours. All right, we'll get you to the next page. There you go. Uh, revised Ninjas and Super Just, Spies because you no, demanded it. Was it say right? What, okay, that's what I was gonna say. No, I didn't. Thank you. That's all I wanted to say. <laughs> However, this this strikes me as an awesome concept, and I never could actually find a copy of this, but the concept really just sounds cool. King Arthur is a mutant. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the bomb struck. King Arthur uh, is see, back. I, I've, oh, heavens, I've got this book. Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's kind of awesome. I, yeah, no, it, it is what it is. It is what you'd expect it to be. <laughs> it's the, the, these are the folks that give us Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Yes. Um, I do wonder, it's so Palladium Books Department D is where you would order King Arthur. Um, what do you get from Departments A, B, C, E, Q? I see, I see one person sitting alone in a cube that measures 10 by 10. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, all right, well, it, it's Thanksgiving as we're talking here, so hunting tanks is fun and easy. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's not easy. It might be fun, but it's not easy. Um, you know, the U.S. Marine Corps says that hunting tanks is funny. No, it's not. Because the, the problem is, the first time you miss, you're screwed. They've got thermal sights and lots of machine guns. We're, look, as a tanker, I will tell you, it is, it is highly, highly unlikely that we are going to waste a main gun round on a person. I'm not saying it's not ever going to happen. Because you might just really, really piss off the wrong guy someday, and he's going to put a sabo dart through your ass. But... We've got a 50 cal and two M240s bolted on there, and the coaxial 240, because it's bolted onto a a 60 ton tank as as the stabilizer mechanism. You could do surgery with that thing. I mean, it is so ridiculously accurate out to about you know a thousand meters or so with with that coaxial machine gun. Um, we we hit squirrels on berms at 800 meters with like two bullets. It's that stable and that well sighted. So, so yeah, it sounds good. It might make for some good movie magic somewhere along the way. Um, but, but no, hunting tanks is not a fun thing when you're a crunchy. Um, just, just, just for the record, I thought we were squishies. The, the tanking term for guys not in tanks is crunchies. Really? All right. I'm going to use that now. I, I wish to have knowledge. There you go. Ooh, two points for Brent. Well done. Well, the, um, things the crunch when they go through the, uh, when they get stuck in the well, trains. I get it. I, I get it. It's just, there's this long tradition of, uh, people without armor going squish. So yes. I, I had long heard them called, but in any event, I love, you're right to say it's an absolute trope of every bad war movie that guy with bazooka takes out tank. Yeah. And that's not to say it doesn't happen, but I'm not a tanker, nor have I, I've been in some tanks certainly never operated them in anger, but I'm guessing that dude with no cover aiming at front armor of tank is a poor choice. Yeah. So, so here, here's a couple of things, uh, the, the more realistic take, particularly for someone who is zooming in and reading this. So if you're a hero, you can climb on top of a tank and drop a grenade through its hatch. That worked in Red Dawn. Um, it really works. Israeli and Syrian commandos stop tanks this way in battles outside of Beirut. In 1982, but let let's face it, Israeli the, the Israelis and Syrians in Beirut in '82 were flipping nuts. So that's that's not a normal thing to do. Rioters sometimes do it with Molotov cocktails. Again, if you get that close to the tank, the tank crew screwed up, right? And as it says, it's not a good way to collect retirement pay, and they are absolutely correct. the The key thing is there's a difference between killing a tank and making it combat ineffective. So, killing a tank, like actually blowing up the tank such that it is of no further, you know, military use to anyone in the future, is really, really hard to do. That said, a well-placed RPG round in the rear sprocket of an M1 tank, and you now have a pillbox. <laughs> because it's not going anywhere on one tread. Yes. So, so the, the question is, what is it you're trying to accomplish? If you simply want to stop the tank in its tracks so it can't go do something else somewhere down the down the road on the battlefield, shoot off the treads. At at 
at you know and at an absolute worst you've got a pissed off crew that now needs about five or six hours to replace the sprocket and and put a new tread on um it may be more than that depending on you know what's going on but that that's at a minimum you bought yourself a you know a bunch of hours and a pissed off crew the depending on what you're trying to accomplish that's that's the key thing um you know can you incapacitate the tank sure can you kill the crew that's a lot harder uh, but in Iraq uh in in you know Gulf 2 during the insurgency there uh in order to mess with an M1 tank they were having to bury clusters of 155 millimeter howitzer shells and it would take a cluster of three or four shells to really mess up the tanks when when they drove over them and, and they exploded now it would really mess up a tank and there was a report of at least one tank being flipped over by a large enough dual ied blast but that's the level of ordinance that you're talking about needing to really ruin a tank's day is, is three cannon shells that are bigger than the umbrella stand in your front hall. That's not something that commandos are hauling around in their back pockets. Yes. So, um, and even over here when they're talking about several missiles function differently, saggers and swing fires and, uh, and hell fires and AT6s, um, some missiles are wire guided in that literally when the missile shoots out, there's a wire that's uncoiling out of the back of the missile that the the missile firer has to keep that missile on target. Now, you can move it a little bit, and that will adjust where the, the missile is actually going to impact, but that wire has to remain attached to that missile in, or, in order for it to finally hit its target. And that was one of the things they used to teach us. They used to call it the sagger drill. With the tanks, if you detected uh, uh, one of the earlier Soviet ATGMs being fired at you, your what you were supposed to do was immediately sprint for some kind of wood line, you know, fence post, power poles, whatever you could to try to break that wire with the the gunner tracking that missile towards you, so that it would lose its its guidance and then eventually either fall where it is or or just continue on a dead flight and not hit you um hellfires have and like it says the at6s the the russian at6s and later russian at uh rockets have a better tracking system that relies on an initially identified signature to to keep on target um the longbow system same way um the, the longbow radar system for the u.s same thing um but yeah to to actually kill a tank to, to ruin a tank's day and make it combat ineffective, that's a lot more firepower than one dude's carrying it around. Um, not to make it combat ineffective, but to like make it permanently out of commission. If all you want to do is just stop it from whatever it's trying to accomplish at that moment in time, eh, shoot out the treads. Work, I, I hope I never confront it. It works for me. Yeah. Um, here we go. Anti-tank weapons table. There you go. Because, hey, we got to have a chart, don't we? Yes, that's isn't that, a rule. Isn't that the requirement? Um, and and I will say this for the chart. Whoever's in charge of charts at this point is doing a solid job of justifying. Because where you have numerical columns, they are right justified along here. And where you have content, they are center justified. So the columns are a little more cohesive. Uh, this is this is a, a solid A, B plus A on a layout assignment in, uh, in undergraduate graphic design class right there um, could use some stripes some some horizontal stripes just to help read the columns across uh, but that's that's a decent job right there we'll go with that um, all right anything else on on hunting tanks there Jim you good I with think I, I think I'm good I uh, I have I have learned that, uh, that I, well basically I'm a stick into to my to my war games if I want to go hunting tanks there you go yeah <laughs> um, hey, look, a Rollmaster ad. Yeah, but this one, this one's got something very special, and it's in the upper right-hand corner. The critical remember, hit chart. The, these critical hit charts circulated crazy. Again, what's our premise? Anybody ever use them in a game? Probably Pro somebody. You know, the world is big. 
but they were. F I will guarantee you that they were played a hundred times more or read a hundred times more just for the fun of reading crazy things like Blast, blast annihilates foe's entire skeleton. Foe is reduced to a gelatinous pulp. Try a spatula. Yes. You know, and they wanted to tell us as if we somehow would doubt them. Actual critical, just so you know, it's impact E100 from Rollmaster's <laughs> spell law. Yeah. It's like, no, guys, we believe you, really. We, we figure you're telling us the truth. They did this. It was a gimmick. <clears throat> and again, it's almost, I think, it's the apotheosis of everything from Rollmaster. It's excess for its own sake. Yes. Yes. And it's fascinating, and I owned it. I don't think I do anymore, but I certainly did own it, and I sat there and I read through most of them. They're they're crazy, silly, and fun. I'm not using them at the tabletop. Who's got that kind of time? No. Well, what you could do as a DM is pull a half dozen out of those to have them ready to go when somebody sure. gets a critical hit, rather than, oh, critical hit, hang on, let me flip to page 82, let me, okay, now I'm going to roll Talk my D100. Jeez. <laughs> but there, there were some genuinely hilarious moments in those critical hit charts. Oh, yes. Uh, no doubt. They were clever. Yeah. Um, the making of a monster. If you want to play tough monsters, then think like they do. One of these days, we're going to get to Tucker's Kobolds in whatever... Whatever Dragon Magazine issue those originally appeared, because Tucker's Kobolds were a riot. Um, but here we go. Almost all attributes of the monsters in the games are detailed in ways that can be used in precise manner. So hit dice, hit points. Um, we we made the we made the comment on a previous show about the fact that cougars had both a bite and claw attack. Yes. So. Um, Did now? Well, the 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 only question that bears here to me. Did you, ever, did you ever make yourself up as a monster? I did not. I, I did. I don't know as I used these tropes, but I went through and I went through. Actually, I have a couple versions of myself as a D&D &D monster, some of which actually eight characters. So. There you go. Uh, playing your monsters subjectively is a good way to stop treating each monster simply as a column of statistics. And so, you know, why... It, it, this, this sounds so you know, geeky drama club, but, you know, what's the character, what's the, the monster's motivation? What are they trying to do? Um, you take that back. You take that back. You make that sound like a bad thing. <laughs> it's uh, oh, it, one of my favorite role-playing memes out there. Is there's there's a meme somewhere of a, a very, very rotund trumpet player in a marching band uniform, high school kid probably. Uh, this kid is roughly square. I mean, just... You know, about five four in every possible direction, and uh, and the hat squeezed way too tight on the head and playing the trumpet. And the the caption is "Role players, there's always a bigger geek." So, as long as the drama kids were around, the role players always had a different set of geeks they could pick on. Well, so. we always used to say at the Renaissance Fair that at least we're not carnies. Yeah, there you go. Um, so there you go. Question of survival: Are they simply? You know, logic dictates that an ogre does not sit around waiting for a party of humans to arrive and finish him off. <laughs> I, I have a mountain of early, you know, of late 70s, early 80s D&D &D modules that would contest that assertion. <laughs> 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 so, yeah. Um, you know, give the ogre some missile power. Give him a spear. Throw a battle axe at somebody. There you go. Uh, but brains make the monster. Now, the gelatinous cube is not sitting around writing poetry before it eats you. But, um, I mean, I imagine if it did, it would be Vogon poetry. But the <laughs> um, wh what is it that the monster is trying to accomplish? And, and let's face it, you know, for, for many of us these days, again, you and I between us have 70-odd years worth of, of role-playing experience, that these things are sort of a no-duh kind of statement to us today. The fact that this was worthy enough of inclusion in a Dragon magazine even into the early 90s tells you that this was not a widespread consideration at the time. No. Mm -hmm. um, uh, to their credit, we got graphics. 
right? We've got we've still got a little bit of a paste up challenge up here with the yellows not matching on the uh, on the header versus the the background color. Um, oh, this yellow. Yeah. Well, clearly they clearly they pasted that up. Oh yes. So, I mean, transparencies had been invented at this point. PageMaker has been around for a while. What's the matter, people? That, that's an affirmative. Yep. All right. Uh, care for a drink. The decanter of endless water. There you go. I, <laughs> Here's what I, I want to know. How come every fantasy cool. fire department out there didn't have a decanter of endless water on its fire engines? And I, but I give them a lot of credit. I, I've always enjoyed role-playing uses for simple things that are more clever than it might suggest. Right. Others would argue that it, that some of the things this guy proposes doing with the decanter of endless water are in abuse. But you know what? If you're clever, you're clever. Yeah. So. Oh, European Gen Con. There you yeah. go. Yeah, this is, this is one of countless attempts well no they can be counted but one of many <laughs> attempts to move gen con over to europe to move it to the west coast move it, it just never worked it's very interesting to me that pax uh, unplugged which is, was we record this seems to be succeeding in a yeah. way that gen con east gen con west never did yeah yeah i um, you just, know it's just in, they've tried origin succeeded for a long time alternating coasts um, it's done reasonably well in Columbus. I mean, for a while there, it was starting to, to lag. It's, it's done a great job of coming back since then. Um, but it's, uh, I think it's, it's tough to move a convention around too much because you need a consistency of attendees that needs to happen year after year to really make the show go. And that's tough to do if you keep flip-flopping coasts. Because, oh, yes. we're going this year, but we can't go next year. We can go the year after that. So what are we going to do on the year in between? Oh, hey, we had a really good time at this other convention. Why don't we just go back to that one again next year? So, yeah. Um, all right. Let's keep on going here. Some TSR previews. What was coming up in July? There's your arms and equipment guide. The AD&D trivia game, because Lord knows, with a room, you know, with an entire... Building full of game designers, the best we could come up with was a trivia game. I, my hatred of gaming trivia games runs white hot. <laughs> there are so many dumb games out there, like, uh, my, my son is actually kind of fond of, we didn't play test this at all. In fact, I'm holding <laughs> it in my hands right now. Um, I'll play we didn't play test this at all any time. It's dumb it is what it is, but it actually gives me a laugh or two. Truth in advertising. Not, <laughs> yeah, I will not play the AD&D trivia game. Take that away. Throw that nonsense out. and it's, it, Play the game. If you are playing the trivia game, you should be playing the game. Yeah. Oh, I remember the first time I saw this at Gen Con, and I thought, who, what, what don't you, you, do you own all of it? That can only be for somebody who owns all the D and D and must have something else. Yeah. Well, and I think that's where the AD and D trading cards came in as well. Um, yes. Now I will tell you. I don't know. This is. I actually have the proof sheet for the AD and D trading cards. I have the complete box set here in the in the room somewhere, out here in the yeah, in got, the game den. I've got them. I've got them on. I think four. I think it's four. Full size poster sized roll ups. Yeah, they were a friend of mine worked at the printing press where they made them, and he sent me four of the proof sheets. That's that's pretty and awesome. He was very thoughtful, gave them to me, and I thought, cool, this is like a game at its early stages. And everyone's no, there's no game here. It's the trading cards. What? It's not a game. Oh, I was angry. That yes, that made me angry too. So I had a friend of mine who who. You know, the, some good friends of mine were the guys that worked at and ran the local game store across the street from the uh, from the university here. And uh, you know, a couple of them were at my were at my wedding. Um, I mean, they, these these were some great friends of mine. And and one of the things just in the chats around the AD and D trading cards that we talked about, they said because uh, they had a box of the trading cards up there at the register. Uh, you know, not not too many years later, they were supplanted 
by the boxes of Magic the Gathering cards. Uh, and at the time, they had the, the AD&D trading cards. But then also, uh, on a shelf off to the side, they had the complete box sets of the full run of the D&D trading cards uh, in the, the big, long, skinny shoebox like that you'd find the full set of baseball cards. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and they couldn't keep those in stock. And I think they maybe opened the second pack of what we would now call the booster cards of the, the little foil packs. Um, I think they, they may have opened one second box of those, but they probably had 10 or 12 boxes of those that they never even cracked shrink on because they never had to put them on display. Nobody would buy the, 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 the packs of individual cards. Everybody wanted to buy the complete set because nobody wanted to have to chase them around. Like, Why would I chase them all around and have to like actually trade the trading cards? When I can go buy the whole set, just call it good. And uh, that's what I did. <laughs> so I totally get it. One thing, I'm, I'm zoomed in here on purpose because one of the things that I wanted to, to point out. So we saw in the earlier Walden Books ad, new products for August, Maztica, the D&D Forgotten Realms box set. And so this was the Aztec and Mayan-like high culture for the Forgotten Realms. But if you take a gander over to the center column, we have HWR1, the Sons of Azka Hollow World reference set, which is the Mayan and Aztec-inspired setting for the Mastara world. So clearly, TSR had Aztec fever at the time and, uh, and was, was running parallel developments of an Aztec-like setting for two completely different game worlds. And one wonders why they had financial trouble down the line. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, so how much of the forum do we really want to dig into, or do we want to just keep on going here? I say we keep, well, we're on page, uh, what, 30 of 124? <laughs> Let's keep going. Hey, riffs. Um, champions, don't just read the comic books. Let's play them. But here's the Marvel file. And so, you know, again, the Marvel superhero role-playing game is one of the TSR properties at this time. And so we've got stats for various Marvel characters. So we've got Dark Hawk um, running around here and, and some information. So here we go. Newest hero on the block, one of the inner city heroes. And so one of the things that you found in the Marvel file and the uh, kind of the TSR releases is that TSR was working with Marvel Comics to try and time game content with uh, newly introduced or newly prominent heroes uh, within the comic book lines so that you can go read the comics and immediately go grab Kids. the Kids. Kids. <laughs> there was once a time when Marvel Comics couldn't figure out how to make money. Yeah. Yeah. And so they came up begging to TSR and said, please help us market our games or our, our intellectual properties. Well, in part because they gave ROM you know, a, a 75 issue run, you know, ROM was the, the hot toy of like 1978 and they, they kept the comic book going until, you know, 85 or something like that. It's like, they should have shut that down a lot earlier. Um, all right. The role of books. Did you read any of these? Uh, I was actually, that's where I was just a second ago. Uh, Achilles choice by Niven and Barn Barnes tour. Uh, which is on page anything else? Oh, yeah, good night, Mr. Holmes. <laughs> I will say, so, Stephen Law, The Paradise War. Um, I've not read The Paradise War. I've read a half dozen other Stephen Law books. The guy is a fantastic writer. Um, I, I would wholeheartedly recommend whatever you can find from him. Uh, but if you want to find a specific book that, because he writes a lot of series, if you want a single volume book that is an incredible read, track down Byzantium by Stephen Law. It's the story of an Irish monk who was on a pilgrimage to Byzantium to deliver a hand copied, uh, a handwritten copy of the Bible that he and his brothers had created in Ireland. They're going to go present this to some grand mucky muck in in Constantinople, um, and uh, and and as soon as they hit the shores of France, he gets kidnapped by Vikings, by a Viking raiding party. Uh, he still manages to end up in Constantinople, but I'm not going to tell you how because that would ruin part of the story. Um, but, but it is a fantastic read and a great romp through late medieval, uh, Europe, uh, with the Vikings, with the, the Eastern Roman empire. Uh, it's, it's a good read. It's definitely worth checking out. Um, there's good night, Mr. Holmes, as you mentioned. So straightforward mystery novels. There you go. <clears throat> 
Parallel Adventure starring Holmes' uniquely gifted female rival. So Irene Adler. Excellent. Um, Swordbreaker. It's an ad. All right, here we go. Voyage of the Princess Ark. So here we are, part 18. So there's there's been 18 of these guys up to this point. These are the journals of Prince Haldemar of Hacken. He's got a flying boat, not unlike, you know, Captain Hook's flying ship from Peter Pan. Um, but they, they've got a sky ship that they're flying around in. And these are the things that expand the Gazetteer series for the Mastara world. And uh, and so here we go. What, what are we doing with the Princess Ark? Uh, we're paying it. We're, we're paying a visit to Slagovich, which is out on the Savage Coast, and uh, this is written as a journal. I was fortunate, so so you can you can envision him narrating. Captain's log, star date, Hastmere four. <laughs> I was unfortunate enough to run into Leo on my way to the commander's deck in an attempt to explain all the refinements he brought to me as blueprints. Um, so there you go. So this would be inspirational fiction, right? I mean, this was intended to inspire me to do a story in the uh, to an extent in this world because they do provide they do provide some actual stat info here with Red Steel, Slagovich, most of the Savage Coast, brutal land, often plagued by wars, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The other thing that they had, yeah. and I'm I'm looking for where it would have been. Yep, there we go. So, so they've got the game stats on Red Steel. How do these things work? So Cinebril is the rare fossil, um, and, uh, and and Cinebril becomes a, a fairly key component in the whole piece of the, the Red Steel Savage Coast setting. Um, currency values are as follows. You've got a bright, a fair, a dim, and a dark. There you go. Um, but part of what the, uh, the series did is it blew out the trail maps. It took what was on the trail maps and expanded everything around. So here you have the city state of Slagovich and its environs. And there is a ridiculously detailed amount of mapping that went into the Princess Arc series. We're, we're talking one hex equals eight miles. They did the equivalent of the United States plus on an entire hemisphere of a planet at eight miles over the series of the Gazetteers, plus the uh, plus the Princess Arc material, plus filling in a couple of gaps here and there with some modules. Um, a, a, a ton of content here. Um, you can still find a lot of these maps updated, cleaned up, deconflicted in a few cases. It's a guy named Thorfinn Tate that keeps the, uh, keeps the flame burning for Mastara out there. Um, with regards to the map component, Thorfinn's maps are fantastic. Um, uh, that's, that's what he's doing. Um, Voyage of the Princess Arc almost became kind of a magazine within a magazine because look, they've got their own letters column. It's kind of cool. So. Did you ever do much with the Mastara world at all or deal with no, this? No, um, it's, as I say, it was, uh, I very quickly went from modules, and I ran through a ton of the modules that are clearly become part of this. Yeah. Uh, but eventually, I, I grabbed the pieces, I guess, and I am only slowly, and I, this is an embarrassing admission from someone of my relatively fair level of experience, to realize that they all connected together. Yeah. Yep. Yep. In a, if you take the original map from X1, you can bolt onto it with a whole bunch of the X-Series modules. Um, and uh, 2 and 3, not so much, uh, but 4, 5, 6, 9, 11, and 12 all significantly bolted onto the map from there. And then once you get beyond that, uh, CM1, the first companion one, uh, stretched the continent almost all the way to the North Pole. Um, but then you go back again pull out the Princess Arc stuff and start following through and, and the, the world gets a whole lot bigger and a whole lot more detailed because eight miles to a hex, I mean, just think about your commute to work is probably more than eight miles. Sure. You know, I mean, the city of Milwaukee is going to take up, you know, half of this map. So, that's... Hey, look, figures you can see. <laughs> it's amazing... What you can do with some color in your pages. 
There we go. And of course. Well, the technology had to evolve. Yes. Fair. And and so did the 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 payroll of Dragon Magazine. Um, but again, our Aztec kick continues because now we've got feathered serpents. Yes. Uh, Rao Partha Power. There's your battle tech guys. How many of those can you name? Ooh, let me see. 893 is the gimme. That's the marauder. One, two, three, four. Man, these things were squatting weird. Yeah. I've still got a bunch of these. I had to go take a look. I'm pretty sure 890 wow. is a Jenner. Um, 898's an Atlas. That was a bit of a gimme. So, I'm not sure these are all scaled properly, but... It's yeah, that's still, what I'm looking at. That is so weird. It may just be the, the various blow-ups of the images. but um, That's so weird. What is unfortunate is that after such fantastic figure photography over here, we're still back to unpainted models against a black background. Yes. Sad. Um, all right, more Palladium ads. You know, I know Palladium sold a lot of books. I saw more Palladium books at used bookstores than I ever did on the shelf at any regular bookstore. Yeah, and I, that is something that, you know, it's funny you say that because I was having the exact same thought. It's really starting to get to me, given the quantity of Palladium ads we've seen over the course of these episodes. With that, If you folks want to comment in the forums, I'd love to see how many of you are playing Palladium. Yeah. Well, I suspect I, it's kind of like the Rollmaster stuff where lots of people bought the the guidebooks as guidebooks as information particularly the castles one and the medieval weapons one those were pretty well detailed and and the research i can only assume was good i don't know enough about medieval weaponry to question their research um but but i know that i had the castles one for a long time as a reference book on castles not because i was using any of the game stats in it sure so um, Bladestorm, Fantasy Miniatures Gaming in a Dark Chaotic World, because, you know, we needed another Fantasy Miniatures rule. Well, we needed another set of Fantasy Miniatures skirmish games. Yeah. There was, there was, um, the, with 2nd Edition, D&D, came the Battle System, the miniatures game for Dungeons & Dragons. The Battle System and wasn't designed as a minis game, as a skirmish level game, was it? I mean, battle no, system, no, I remember being... That was that they, was Big Wars. That was Armies. Yeah. But they released a skirmish version of it subsequently. Isn't that because, D&D? <laughs> yeah, see, you have arrived <laughs> precisely at my point. Why? It's suddenly... <coughs> it, I, what, what's the line from Star Wars? Now the circle is complete. Yeah. You've, you've gone all the way out you were frustrated, you didn't just want to play with individual figures and stories and, and tales, so you wanted to have armies, massive armies, big armies, sweeping armies. Oh, but, but this is too much. Let's have skirmishes. Wait, that's where we started. <laughs> uh, the Summit Games Network. This is where you get to take over. The Summit Games Network. The first games-only network. Okay. To order Watch by like modem. You. To order by modem. I'm not making this up. You could order by modem. Disket size, five and a quarter or three and a half. Okay. Yes, you could still order five and a quarter discs from these guys. What is the... So th this is a website, basically. This is this is a bulletin board system for, for gaming, yeah. They have an 800... They have an 800 number phone line service nationwide. Yep. Modem checking. Okay. Our network allows you to okay. upload and download Thank files you. simultaneously. Not just ah. upload and download, but hyphenated uploads and downloads. <laughs> and a lifetime membership fee was a mere $15. Oh wow! This is—it's so strange because obviously I was—I was in graduate school. I was—I was, I was, I was in my PhD at this point, but so I lived through this. But this is so. Now that I'm looking at it from the perspective of 2017, 
this is an artifact. I feel like Indiana Jones. <laughs> what were you doing? What was this for? Wow. Yeah. You're crazy. Uh, the role of computers. The role of Thank computers. Thank you, Summit Games Network. There is your Eye of the Beholder. The first graphically based fantasy role playing game for computers is fantastic. There you go. I, well, I would, I certainly beg to differ. But yeah, Bard's Tale is going to have an argument so with you there. Yeah, yeah and Bard's Tale was the better game, actually. <laughs> well, and Bard's uh, Tale's but almost I, into its second decade at this point. So. Yes, yes. We have and had people. Was, quote unquote. Yeah. We, we've had some people comment online that they actually played the Buck Rogers computer game. Um, so we found somebody that did that. That We still haven't found anybody who's played the tabletop role-playing game. We found people who will admit to owning parts of it, but I, they, they, when asked if they ever played it, they, they get curiously evasive. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's delightful that they want to defend it. Yeah, well, okay. <laughs> um, but, and then the... Our, our, our argument that nobody actually played it still stands. Yeah. Dungeon Master Chaos Strikes Back. Okay, Dungeon Master, the original, is one of my favorite games of all time. Uh, this was for the Amiga uh, in the days of the Amiga 500. This is, you can see it's the 2000 there. Yeah. This was a really, really good dungeon crawl. My uh, brother and I played this obsessively. You couldn't play multiplayer, just sat and watched each other play. Uh, we played this for many, many hours. It was a great, great game, and it's uh, one of my favorite memories of this area of gaming. So here's to you, Dungeon Master. Yep. And uh, here we are, the, the, the Gold Box Edition D&D games from SSI, set in the Forgotten Realms universe. There's our Secret of Silver Blades, uh, coming on the cool. heels of Pool of Radiance and Curse of the Azure Bonds. Um, it occurs to me that SSI is our Slytherin. At the time, so, yes. Yeah, they were they were doing niche war games, niche role. Now, this was as broad as it was going to get, I suspect. I don't know if Slytherin has ever sold a game that sold as many copies as the Gold Box did, but my point is going to stand that yeah. they, they produced a ton of absolutely precious war games. I mean, they did Battles of Napoleon, which oh, is yeah. still one of the best simulations of Napoleonic warfare ever done. Yeah. Um, and, and all those work. Age of Rifles, which go on to the Grogheads forum, and it all it takes is, I, I, I would love to have, it's like that thing you have at a factory, where it says, we've gone 17 days with no injuries. <laughs> well, we've, we've gone 14 days with nobody calling for a remake of Age of Rifles. <laughs> all right, here's your lemmings. This is where, as far as I can figure, this is where castle defense comes from as a concept. The whole premise of the game is these little lemmings are going to go across the field and they will jump to their death or be squished. You have to figure out a way to get them through safely. Um, it was endlessly replayable. It was incredible fun. And watching them splat to their deaths and scream, they gave off these little ah! screams as they died absolute classic Amiga gaming from the day. Two of my favorite Amiga games are on are in this issue of Dragon. There you both go. Both Lemmings and Dungeons. Um, Alright. If you're ready for Adventure on Gemstone or any of our other 12 exciting multiplayer games, sign up for Genie today. So we are now going from play-by-mail to playing online on bulletin boards. Yes. That's that was the thing, and I, I wanted to do it so badly. I you know we I will make fun of it now all you want, but we wanted to do this because, frankly, we didn't often have enough opportunity, especially as I got, you know, grad school. For those who don't know, can be a bit of a lonely experience. <laughs> you don't have your high school buddies, you don't have your college buddies. They've all gone off. Some of them actually have these things called jobs, and you're looking for ways to do it remotely and to still hang out with each other. And that's why, that's why there are still guys who play over things like Yahoo and, uh, yeah. and fantasy been... realms and all these other online services because they can't get together with their people. So this is, this is the birth of that. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, now, now the tech, the technology here, holy cow. But yeah. 
I like I like the bit. fact that you had to set your modem to half duplex. <laughs> Local echo, 300, 1200, 2400 baud. And then at the U at the U hashtag prompt, enter that string and hit enter. Um, and then give that your credit card. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw a, I'm I'm gonna throw a flag on you for vocabulary. It was not a hashtag back then. That was still the pound That's sign. That's true. It was a pound sign. That's absolutely right. I, I give myself negative three points for incorrect diction. And and Those let's also note points. who the who the corporation behind this is. GE, bringing good things to life. Holy cow! Well, that's where the GE and Genie came from. Yep. All right, we got to move on here. We're still only halfway through this issue, dude. We're going into our second hour of this, and we're only halfway through the issue. Um, All right, hold on, Some more SSI ads. Here comes some uh, some fiction, and we're going to skip right past it because we got to we got to keep going here. Um, so Forgotten Realms first book an exciting new book series I love this their fate is in your hands and yet the, the their fate really isn't in your hand like you're reading the book but it's not like you have anything to do with it other than reading the book um, so um, I, of note on here I have actually read Elf Shadow by Elaine Cunningham the one up here in the corner um, it's a good book Elaine Cunningham writes, writes good stuff um all right, the Battletech game world. So we've got Solaris 7 coming soon. Um, bat, basic battle tactics for your superheroes. Something I want to I wanna showcase here. What was one of the biggest complaints about AD&D 4th Edition? The attempt to overly emulate the uh, World yeah, of Warcraft paradigm Warcraft. of... You've got your tanks, your strikers, your artillery, your sort of... Yep. Your, your, okay, so here we go. Combat categories. There's our infantry. You can see what's coming, right? Absolutely. <laughs> that, that's a good point. There that's are our speedsters point, yeah. with our offensive see, and defensive tactics. See, Here's see, our see, airborne. There's our air is, cover. This is one of the great dividing lines. This is, this is one of the great dividing lines in gaming. What are you gaming for? Yep. Here are our shock if, troops, if our artillery, there's our stealth, our mentalists. Guess what, guys? <laughs> this is every complaint everybody had about 4th edition AD&D in 1991 talking about superhero games. You're not role-playing. <laughs> You're playing a war game, which I like. You're playing yeah. a skirmish tactical game. You're not role-playing. Okay, sure. Well, but let's be fair. This is specifically basic battle tactics for your superheroes. This isn't everything you're doing in the game. This is simply how to get in a fight a little better. So there's plenty yeah, more that you can do around this in terms of the conversation and investigation and whatever else. But but the but the whole why are you, Benjamin Grimm never spent one day saying to himself, "I'm a shock character. I must tank this person." Yeah. None of these people that we admired, as, especially, it's especially noxious among superheroes. Yeah. I think because they do lend themselves to this so much. If you, Which is why I don't play Heroclix. <laughs> the only game of Heroclix I've ever enjoyed were the, the absurd fights against Galactus when Galactus was first revealed. Yeah. Well, there was no, one I year at Origins, a bunch of, of guys set up uh, a Heroclix game in the hallway... It, it was up on the bridge between the convention center and the hotels um, over the railroad tracks that run through the middle of the convention center there. They were up on the bridge. They kind of set themselves up in the corner one, one afternoon, and they had about four map sheets pushed together, and they had a carpet of figures all over this map. And apparently one of the guys from WizKids walked by and was like, what are y'all doing? And the guy said, we just wanted to see what a 10,000-point Hero Clicks game would look like. <laughs> and... And so the 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 whiz kids guys, to their to their credit, they were they were true. They said, "All right, here's what we want you guys to do. Y'all play this out overnight. You know, y'all play this, play the whole thing, like however long it takes. Take a picture about every hour so that we can see that you guys are still playing throughout the, you know, playing this game along and, and whatever. And if y'all get to the end of it, we've got a pretty you know pretty cool prize pack that we'll give you guys. And <laughs> like 
9 o'clock the next morning as the vendors are coming back in to set up the vendor hall. These guys are still playing. <laughs> they, they were going to play it all the way out, though. <laughs> and and, uh, and the we WizKids have, dudes apparently hooked them up with some serious swag. We have, we have talked a lot about you can at a con, because that's in part what cons are for in my humble judgment, you can at a con get nuts about any game. Yes. I'll, I'll give you that. Yes. That's what they're there for. Role -playing game. Uh, let's talk about Dark Conspiracy on another show when we've got a little more time. Because sure. it's it's worth discussing, but we need to keep moving here. All right, our role-playing reviews. So, three, yes. So, all three of the ones that I was expecting to see are actually in here. And that is King's Festival over on the far left and the Legions and Arena of Thyatis over on the right page. Those guys I, I knew. Um, I, I figured would be in here based on the, the timing of this issue. I'm a big fan of the low-level games where you've got you've to think fast and improvise and you can't just brute force your way through everything you run into. I, I like that because I think it makes the characters a little more interesting when they have to work at it. Um, and so these low-level adventures are the kinds of things I really dig. King's Festival I've played twice. Um, I played the Arena of Thyatis. I've never played Legions of Thyatis, although I own them both and have read them both. Um, I... I I enjoy that level of gaming. That's something that I have a good time with. There was also Queen's Harvest. I've played King's Festival. I've not played Queen's Harvest. Um, I've not played Puppets or Nightwatch. Interestingly, Puppets right here, this uh, this Greyhawk one, that is not an original piece of art for the module. That piece of art appeared about seven years earlier as the cover of a Dragon magazine. <laughs> that we'll probably see one of these days. Um, I, I, will, I will say with respect to all these... Played them, re-engineered them for first edition, which I still prefer, and each one of them is well worth playing. Yeah, yeah, fun games. I I enjoy the low level stuff. Um, so you know, King's Festival, Queen's uh, Queen's Harvest combined game there. Um, I, I've played King's Festival, not played Queen's Harvest. Um, we didn't do it with the pre roll PCs. We we used our own. Um, so we uh, that's that's what we went with the. Those are set in the BECMI D&D world, not the AD&D world, um, so for what that's worth. Uh, and, and, just for, and just for the record, um, I don't know if it's Arena or Legions that caused me to write to John Nephew, who actually sent me a very nice letter back. And I said, I don't know if you're the first one to come up with an incredibly weak supervillain. Arch <laughs> But if you're not, it's the first one I've met, and it's so incredibly well done. You will meet people who do not like Arena particularly because they don't know what to do. Yeah. It, it doesn't shoot you through the tube the way a lot of people want to do. Yeah. But, yeah. Oh, but oh my goodness, it's a great story. If you, if you can, pick it up. i, I got to think you can find it at Half Price Books for five bucks. If it's that. so worth it. Yeah. Um. And, and part of the challenge was, like you said, you know, there are so many adventures that sort of run on rails that that was a good one that didn't. Um, yes. Probably the best adventure not on rails out there is B10, Night's Dark Terror. Um, and you'll never find me say a bad word about it ever. Um, but you'll have a hard time finding any serious Mastara fan who dislikes B10. Um, let's keep on moving here. We've got... Uh, as Vidium announces Vampire, there you go. We've seen there one of these go. ads before. Uh, Conquer the Solar System by Mail, The Making of a Conquest of the 25th Century, PBM, The Real Story. We're still this is, not just playing I, by I, mail, I, I, but we're talking about how to play by mail. Well, this is Bruce Nesmith, right? Yeah. So this is a guy who knows from games. Yeah. Yeah, and the the fact that he would he that this is this is fascinating. I'm going to do a little more reading about this one. This is one of those things. That's why I love doing these. Because of, so this is where you came from, huh? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, he is he is he has designed an amazing array of games over the years, and the fact that he would be involved in this one, yeah, really is pretty remarkable. And this is when TSR still had Buck Rogers fever. Um, hadn't quite yeah. recovered from it, so we've we've now got 
a role-playing game that we've seen a significant marketing push for but can't find anyone who played it. We've got a computer game that some people will admit to having played. And we've got a play-by-mail game at a time in which play-by-mail is rapidly being supplanted by people playing online with each other. And and so, you know, again, much like the role-playing game, I, I'm curious how many folks ever actually played the, 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 the play-by-mail game, particularly given the cost involved in this. No hidden turn costs. Oh, my God, these, cur- these turns get expensive. Right, turns one through yep. six cost four fifty each. Yep. Right, that's twenty seven bucks. Yep. Yeah. You know? Oh yeah, and they 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 wanted to sell this. This is, you know, they were we were trying to make our way to understanding how internet gaming would work, and this was a this I I played in PBM games. They were of course Napoleonic. Yeah. They were not. And, but like you say, it's the turns are what they are. But you also have to have rules set up, package, and three turns. Yeah. You see that? Oh yeah. For twenty bucks. Mm-hmm. So, um, sage advice. All right. So how do we? How many angels can fit on the head of a pin? All right. Just go to the one in the center, please. DM who insists the wizard spell flies ends effect. Uh huh. I don't know who to hate more in this story. <laughs> I am really, really torn. I hate the DM. Let it be clear. What do you mean it stops when the person lands? Read the spell. But then, this is... this. Do you really write in to sage advice if you didn't have a big fight about it? At this point, what you want is you want somebody else to settle it so you can go back to your buddy with a copy of the magazine and go, You're wrong! Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's the entire so, point of this. I don't like either of you. <laughs> I don't like either of you. Although, and I sort of respect, although I think it's overwritten, the response. This sounds like a workable house rule. But there is nothing in the spell description in either edition of the game that even begins to suggest that this is the case. <laughs> okay, if that's true, then it's a sucky house rule. <laughs> all righty then if by workable you mean ah, yes i'm sorry that's I, I do really love this column <laughs> uh talislanta the bard games republishing of it uh <sighs> incidentally you can order it in germany well not a bad thing no elves um there are your game science high impact precision edge dice and remember their warranty. <laughs> All right. Uh, Robotech new generation video cassettes. We're still doing video cassettes. God. DVDs are still 10 years away, people. All right. Now, you, before you go to the next page, I demand you give me a number between 1 and 100. Just a random number? 64. Because that's the jersey of the dude they just had on screen here. All right. Because I've got a football game on in the page. background. Uh, you can now go to the next page while I go, go find out what 64 means because you jumped me to the next page. Oh, well, I'm sorry. That's all right. Sorry. Do I need to give you a lower number? 26. Yeah, you should. 26? What's 26? Because Let's see. I tell you, of all the things I love in Dungeons & Dragons, I don't know as I like anything more than the deck of many things. Yeah. Oh, 26 is I a good one here. Planted that. bean summons a meteor from outer space that strikes the ground within five rounds. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> there, so, so you've done well. I, my son is actually sitting over here. Uh, I'm now going to ask him to give me a number between 1 and 47. <laughs> 36. 36. Right, 36. Let's go see. A creeping doom crawls forth and moves in a random direction, attacking all creatures who do not escape its wrath. Beyond the initial 80 yards, the insect mass loses 50 of its number for every 10 yards it travels. <laughs> Good. You, call, you summon the creeping doom. I love these things. These are, I believe, in the world of players four with the listeners of Dragon of the Past. I believe there are two groups of people in this world. It's a fundamental personality test. There are those who will draw from the deck of many things, and there are those who will not. <laughs> yeah. Part of those that's probably right. are ones that shouldn't. <laughs> well, well, that's that's that is as may be. <laughs> 
All right, the convention calendar. There's Dragon Con. It's a big one. Hasn't conquered Atlanta yet, but still getting there. What else do we have in here? There's Quinn Con. There's Impact. There's Gen Con. 91. You were there. Ooh, uh, I was. Sure and was. Mecca. One back then. So. Part, of my, part of my string. Quite a few in a row. Yep. All right. There's a lot of that. Uh, editorial positions available. They need folks you working. Have have you have to have a degree in English. Which I love, because I do. <laughs> you'd, have been, you'd have been golden. At the time, I was working towards said degree. <laughs> However. How's the cover? How's the cover? Yeah. I was Winter getting there. Fantasy. Back when it was back when it was held at the Ramada. At the, that Ramada is torn down now. That's not there anymore. Um, that's that's gone. But uh, that that drifted for a while. I think it's in Fort Wayne, Indiana now. Huh. Okay. Yeah. We've got some dragon mirth. We've got some chuckles. Love this. They're creeping up on the giant's head. Stay alert. Good scout checks out everything thoroughly, except the head that you're on breathing. So this. This strikes me as every conversation we've ever had at Grogheads. I know things get confusing during battle. Let's take a moment and think, shall we? <laughs> yes. Yeah, that, that applies to many life circumstances, including Groghead's <laughs> conversations. No dispute. Uh, oh, and here's another one. This, th these, are the, these are the guys that are the region, reason the Sage Advice column exists. So if you don't acknowledge encumbrance, then it doesn't exist. All right, there's the Twilight Empire column, which, again, never read. Here's another Palladium ad. I'm, I'm curious. I, I, we're going to go back after this, and we're going to add up how many Palladium ads were in this one episode. One well, episode. just please please remember, by folks online, I want to hear from you. Did, you. did you play a Palladium game? And if so, what? And you can't say Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I want to hear about something else. Yeah, Ninja Turtles doesn't really count. <clears throat> ninjas and Super Spies, right? If you were playing Ninjas and Super Spies, get back to us. So, I mean, yeah, do you count Torg? Because plenty of people played Torg. Yeah, yeah, I would. I'd like if you play Torg. Sure, I'd like to hear that because I actually the one here I played the most in a walk is Recon. Yeah, yeah. Because it's actually a really, really good crunchy uh, Vietnam game. Looking for more gamers. Turn to our convention calendar. There may be a game convention closer than you think. Whether you like board games, role-playing games, miniature war games, or just browsing around. No mention of regular war games. They talk about miniature war games. Not miniatures yep. war games. Miniature war games. War games that can be played on an index card. That S is very important. I agree. I agree. All right. Here's... Through the looking glass, so we've got some figure reviews, some additional, some additional critters, some fairly nifty looking ones. The Origins ninety one painting contest. Nice. It's nice that the painting contest is still going. Um. It all right. Much is. Here's our Dark Sun ad. As Dark Sun is about to to un you know to hit in the world of Athos. Take over the world. Yeah. Um. All right. Life beyond the moons. There's Spelljammer. Spelljammer. I'm surprised we've not come up against more Spelljammer because I I enjoyed Spelljammer a lot. I think it was really just start, starting to find its groove at this point, and I suspect once we get past 171 into the 180s, we will start to see a lot more Spelljammer. All right. There's Mastika. There we go. So, again, dueling Aztec-inspired worlds between the BECMI line that Bruce was shepherding around at the time and the Forgotten Realms world. And uh, that's our back cover. So, uh, we are utterly failing at making these episodes any shorter. In part because the magazines are getting longer. Well, right. The, we probably have done a little better had this been one of those shorter games. Uh, or one of the uh, shorter episodes. That, that I don't know. You mean we would have had a shorter episode if this had been a shorter episode? Uh. <laughs> Touché. You realize that the first rule of Tautology Club is the first rule of Tautology Club. Yes. So, um, I certainly do. I do wish we'd had the trading cards and poster that we could have showcased to our, our fans and friends, uh, all four of them. But, you know, 
uh, we'll, we'll have to make it up in post-production. So, um, all right. So there's a, a relatively more modern Dragon Magazine. I, uh, I, I hope our, our folks enjoyed this. What would you think, Jim? I, uh, not one of my favorites, but it had some good bits. And uh, overall, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say I liked it. It, was, uh, it had a couple of really good articles, but uh, the rest of it was fair to middling. But uh, always a pleasure to trip through them with you. I think what we're starting to see here in the early 90s is, uh, as, as reflected by Dragon, we're starting to see a proliferation of TSR products across a broad spectrum for an audience that may not be able to sustain it all. And, and I think that all comes true uh, in about three more years, four more years. Um, yeah. But really, no, right. at the meta level, what we're seeing is uh, Wargaming is starting to evaporate from Dragon Magazine, which we, we expected. I mean, we knew that was coming. But we're starting to see the digital world elbowing out the analog world in that we don't just have computer games. We are now, we've we've replaced the ads of people looking for gamers to play with, right? We don't have the the personals anymore. <laughs> what we've got instead are ads for things like that Genie service. Um, and and we've got these online things still interacting with the, uh, the, the fact that traditional play-by-mail still exists. Well, they're trying to figure out how this works. Yeah. You know, gamers want to move into that digital space. And we saw PBEM years ago, but here we saw it, you know, with the full attempt to load it into the Star Wars, you know, or the uh, Buck Rogers universe. They tried to do that. Uh, we see all the video games coming in and the role playing. And we also see D&D now 20 years old going on, uh, really heading into another generation where people don't want to do dungeon crawls anymore. They want yeah. to do. They want to have broader adventures, Aztec adventures, all this. But I really, really, really like your point about looking at the telescope backwards, which is always easy enough to do. Yes. But looking at the telescope backwards, we can see the point where the high water, you know, what is Hunter Thompson's line from Fear and Loathing? If you look back and with just the right eyes, you can see the point where the high water mark was hit yeah. and where the water started to roll back. And I think... Honestly, I, I, I'm not sure we're there quite yet based on what we're seeing just in the Dragon magazines. Um, again, we're using Dragon as sort of the imperfect mirror to reflect upon the broader hobby with TSR as the flagship at the time. But um, I, I think we're not quite there yet. I think we've still got about another year, year and a half to go. And sure. I think we've got a combination of, uh, of over uh, overexerting themselves by TSR along with uh, we haven't had Magic the Gathering drop on our heads yet. So, well, I think that's not that's not a small matter. Electronic, Magic the Gathering, um, but also just TSR bloat. Yes, just in excess of uh, in excess of the material. And and ironically enough, we are only about a year or two as as TSR bloat is starting to happen. We're about a year or two from significant bloat over at Apple very similar to what happened at TSR. Apple yes. started to bloat not just their products with things like the, the Newton, but even the actual computer lines themselves, the Quadras and the Performos and all the different numbers getting attached to them. It starts to get a little excessive and consumers are starting to, to not be sure of where they needed to, to dump their money. What is it I should be interested in? Um, which one is the right one for me? And hey, I want to check out some role playing games. Which one of the which one's the right one for me? And you walk in and you're just overwhelmed. There's no easy on ramp at this point. Um, you know, we're, we're starting to see that kind of bloat. The difference is, you know, Apple of course had the visionary to steer them back on course. TSR had, you know, Wizards of the Coast deep pockets come bail them out. <laughs> yep. So. All right. Yay! This was fun. Let's do it again. Absolutely. See you the next time. <laughs>